Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa musalim Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Rabbi syurahli sadri wa yasirli amri Wa halul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And very good morning to all Honorable Prof. Dr. Abdul Aziz Barwood the Dean of ISTEC, who is now in Kuantan, Pahang, attending an important function, but is with us at the beginning of the session today. Professors, Tansri Datu Datu, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this program, Sharahan Manuscript Melayu, or in English, Lecture on Malay Manuscript organized by ISTEC, IIUM. The lectures are to be delivered by prominent speakers in the field of Malay manuscripts, locally and from overseas. There will be 15 lectures under this program, one lecture each at the end of each month. The main objective of the program is to promote Malay manuscript as a primary resource for research on Malay thoughts and civilization, particularly on Malay Islamic thought and civilization. In the planning process of this project, I would like to acknowledge the role of Malaysian Historical Society of Malaysia and ISTEC Library or officially known as Said Muhammad Naqib al Atos Library at his day. The library holds a very rich collection of books and other reference materials, including manuscripts in several languages, including Malay. Before we move to the lecture proper, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Faham bin Mat Ghalib Deputy Dean for Academic and Internationalization of ISTEC to give his welcoming remarks. Prof. Faham is invited. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. And a very good morning to all. Uh, respected moderator of the program, uh, Dr. Wan Ali. One uh, Muhammad and uh, respected our speaker today, Professor Emeritus Kawashima Miduri. Uh, uh, welcome, Professor from Sophia University, Tokyo. We really honor your attendance to be here with us. Uh, representative uh, uh, of uh, Historical Society Malaysia, as co organizer of the program, scholars, academicians, librarians, and students. On behalf of Professor Dr. Abdulaziz Barwood, uh, the STAC Dean, uh, we would like to welcome all uh, to this event, which is a monthly lecture series on Malay manuscript. Uh, as what known uh, in the field where many uh, manuscripts are defined as handwritten text in Malay language, written on portable medium like paper, leather, or maybe three layer. Uh, Malay manuscript is an important component of Malay civilization because it documents in writing the mind of the past Malay society. Malay civilization has passed through two major phases. The first phase, the Malay writing tradition was in strongly influenced by the Indian writing tradition. That's the first phase. And the second phase by the Islamic writing tradition. Whereas the heritage from the Indian phase was very limited, the heritage from the Islamic tradition was immense indeed. 
the tens of thousands of Malay manuscripts were written in the second phase. Unfortunately, those rich resources were rare, rarely used as the objects of research, especially in our country, Malaysia. My dear professors, academicians, students, and fellow friends, in this stack, our library, Said Muhammad Nukaib al Abtas Library alone, we have nearly 3,000 manuscripts and over 2,000 manuscripts in microfilm format, out of which 1989 written in Malay and other manuscripts were from different languages such like Arabic, Urdu, Persian, Turkish, and Dawoodi. These manuscripts are from different collections such as Oriental Manuscript Collection from Moscow State University, School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS Collection, British Library Collection, Pocock Collection, Helmut Witter Collection, Ghazi Hosref Bay Collection. For your information, our library, with the support from Islamic Religion Council, Wilayah Pakistan, or in short, Jawi or Maui, has initiated a project on digitizing these manuscripts and offer the service for free to the registered library users of the institution. Currently, more than 2,000 manuscripts have been converted into digital format and made available to them at their fingertips. We in ISTAC welcome researchers, academic community to take benefit of these manuscripts by studying them and uncovering the knowledge embedded in them to understand the development of thought, culture, heritage, civilization during the period they were written. His tag concerned the study of Malay manuscripts as it is one of the dimensions of Malay Islamic civilization and modern world, which is his tech niche area and research interest. Hopefully through this program, it could contribute towards publicizing Malay manuscripts to academic community, not only in the region, but in the whole world at large. We welcome those who are interested in pursuing their preferred studies at master or PhD levels in this specialty to join our institution and contribute to the academic arena accordingly. You are more than welcome as the direction of the institute currently is to increase number of students intake. We are targeting 200 students by 2023 year end in shell. My dear audience, we like to thank all parties for working together with us and facilitating this program till the end of this monthly lecture series. And I've been informed by Dr. Wan that a total of 15 lectures okay, is in the pipeline ranging from different sub-themes related to Malay manuscripts, literary emancipation of Malay thought and civilization. Our today's event is the first focusing on Malay manuscript collection sub-theme. Our thank and appreciation are also dedicated to the speaker of the event, Professor Emeritus Kawashima Miduri, who will be sharing with us his expertise and experiences, Dr. Wan Ali Wan Muhammad, for Malay from Malay Islamic Unit and the ISTAC, and co-organizer Historical Society Malaysia for its support morally and financially in making this program as what witness it today. On behalf of STAG, representing the Dean, we would like to affirm our assistance and support for any activities, research, publication pertinent to Malay Islamic thought and civilization. Last but not least, we wish all the best to the participant 
Thank you very much and thank you for being here with us in this session. Wabillahi tafidah. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Faham, for the welcoming remarks. Dear professors, yes. okay. Tansri Datuk Datuk, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the first lecture today will be delivered by our esteemed guest, Prof. Emeritus Kawashima Midori from Sofia U University, Tokyo. Welcome, Prof. Midori, to our Sharahan Manuscript Melayu Program or Lecture on Malay Manuscript Program. Thank you very much for your acceptance of our invitation to be the first speaker. Actually, uh, Prof. knows how to speak in Malay and how and able to read Jawi text, but she prefer to speak in English. <laughs> the topic for Prof. Midori lecture today is uh, for me very interesting because it is about manuscript in Mindanao. We seldom heard about Malay manuscript originated from the Philippines and Mindanao, although we believe of their existence. The strife in Mindanao in the past years prevented us to trace Malay manuscript there. However, we are very proud and very thrilled to know that Prof. Manduri was able to trace and access Malay manuscript there, not only in Mindanao, but also even in uh, Manila. So the title of her lecture will be Circulation of Malay Manuscript and their Influences on Religious Literature in Mindanao. Perhaps there will be some amendment to the topic. However, first I would like to read Prof. Midori Biodata. Uh, Kawashima Midori is Professor Emeritus of Sofia University in Tokyo. She obtained a bachelor's degree in social anthropology from Tokyo Metropolitan University and a master's degree in international relations from Tokyo University and taught at the Faculty of Global Studies of Sofia University until her retirement in 2019. She spe specializes in Philippine politics and modern history with a special focus on Muslim in the Philippines. She has written extensively on these subjects, both in Japanese and English. Her current research include political, social, and religious movements and thoughts of Muslims in the Philippines and the networks linking Mindanao with other parts of Asia and the Middle East. She also conducts research on Islamic manuscript and printed books of Mindanao and Sulu in a bid to bring to light their documented inter intellectual heritage. So that's a short uh, by data of Prof. Midori. Now I would like to invite Prof. Midori to deliver her lecture. Uh, the floor is now yours, Prof. Thank you. First of all, I would like to express my thanks to the organizers of the lecture and especially to Dr. Wang Ari for inviting me to speak. One of my areas of research is the history of the Muslims in Mindanao Sulu in the Southern Philippines. When I started the research on this subject many years ago, I found that the existent academic works on the history of the Muslims in Mindanao Sulu were heavily dependent on source material written in Spanish, English, and other Western languages. On the other hand, 
the intellectual contribution of those who wrote in local languages and other non-Western languages tend to receive minimal attention. The manuscripts written by the Muslims in Mindanao and through themselves are essential source materials for the study of their intellectual life and history. However, very few such manuscripts were available for research at the time. Most of old manuscripts have been privately preserved as family heirlooms, and they have been rarely shown to those outside the family. Therefore, I started searching such manuscripts focusing on the province of Lanao del Sur in Mindanao and initiated several research projects for surveying locally preserved manuscripts and books in this area. I invited several researchers, both from the Philippines and outside, to participate in these projects. These projects resulted in the publication of several volumes of books which describe and discuss the materials we had identified. This lecture is based on these researches. This lecture covers five pound, pound points. First, I will give a brief overview of Islamic manuscripts in Mindanao and Sulu in general as the background. Second, I will illustrate the characteristics of the manuscripts of Mindanao and their importance as the rich mine of information showing several images of manuscripts from the Sheikh Mohammed Said collection in Lanao del Sur. Third, I will discuss the relationship between Malay works and those written in vernacular languages in Mindanao. Fourth, I will talk about the decline of Malay manuscripts in Mindanao since the mid 20th century. And to conclude, I argue that Malay manuscripts left a lasting legacy to the development of religious literature of the Muslims in Mindanao. This is the map of maritime Southeast Asia showing the distribution of major languages which are or which were once written using the Jawi or modified Arabic script. Mindanao and Sulu are in the eastern part of the map and languages such as Maranao, Magindanao, Tausuk, Sama, and some others are used in this region. This map shows major ethnic groups composing the Muslim population in the Southern Philippines. They are Maranao, Magindanao, Iranu, Karibugan, Karaga, Sangir, Yakan, Tausug, Sama, Jamamapu, Molbok, Palawan, and a few others. In addition to these vernacular languages, Malay was also used in Mindanao until around the mid 20th century. Malay was the linga franca of trade in maritime Southeast Asia, including the Mindanao and Sulu region. Besides being a trade language, Malay was also used by Islamic intellectuals and students in Mindanao and Sulu as the language for Islamic learning until around the mid 20th century. However, Malay is no longer used in Mindanao, and we can hardly find people who speak Malay in central Mindanao. But the situation is different in the Sulu and Tawitari region, which is much closer to Borneo and Kalimantan. In these places, Malay is still spoken by a considerable number of people. By the term manuscripts of Mindanao and Sulu, I refer to those manuscripts used or written by Muslims of Mindanao and Sulu. Concerning the major depositories outside the Philippines, an article by Dr. Annabel T. Gallop of the British Library serves as a useful reference. I will show you a selected bibliography at the end of my talk. So if you are interested in the works cited in my lecture, please refer to it for details. Manuscripts from Mindanao and Sulu held outside the Philippines are concentrated in the United States. 
Many manuscripts were seized by the American army officers and soldiers during the military operations against Muslims in Mindanao and Sulu in the early 20th century. There is also a case where Muslim leaders presented a manuscript to an American administrator as a gift, while the provenance of many others remain unclear. These manuscripts subsequently found their ways to the libraries and museums in the United States. There are also some in Spain and one in the Islamic Arts Museum Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. The National Library of Indonesia in Jakarta also has a manuscript written in Aceh by a scholar from Mindanao. Manuscripts of Mindanao Sulu which remain in the Philippines include a Koran manuscript, which is held and exhibited at the National Museum of the Philippines in Manila. This manuscript is named Maradika, which means freedom in Maranao. It is also known as the Koran of Bayan because it belongs to the leaders of Bayan, a town in Lano del Sur in Mindanao. This Koran manuscript has a remarkable story. It was copied by Tuan Muhammad Said, who is also known as Hajj Sabinidayam, during his Hajj journey in the early 19th century. This Quran manuscript was inherited by his descendants in Bayan and used by the people of Bayan. Therefore, it is known as the Quran of Bayan. This Quran manuscript was captured by an American surgeon after the Battle of Bayan and brought to the US. I will talk about this Battle of Bayan later. This Quran manuscript was returned to the Philippines in 1980, and it was declared as a national cultural treasure of the Philippines in 2015. However, most of the manuscripts of Mindanao Sulu are privately preserved in family collections. Dr. Samuel Tang, a prominent Filipino historian from Sulu who passed away recently, and Dr. Munap Hairola, also from Sulu, surveyed several depositories of manuscripts in Holo, Basilan, and Tawi Tawi, and published a series of books describing the manuscripts in these collections. In Mindanao, I conducted a survey of a collection of Sheikh Mohammed Said bin Imam Sabayan in Marawi City with Dr. Labi Yuarun of Mindanao State University, Dr. Oman Fatrahman of Sharif Hidayatullah State Islamic University in Jakarta, and Dr. Elfan Durutawab of State Institute of Islamic Studies, Metro Lampung in Indonesia, and compiled an annotated catalog of the collection with essays. Dr. Annabel Gallup also contributed an article on manuscript arts to this volume. As I have worked on this collection for many years, I have become familiar with the contents, provenance, and other details of the manuscripts in this collection. Therefore, I mainly use them in this lecture. In addition to this, we have also surveyed some other manuscripts in a few other collections in Lano del Sur and published a few other volumes dealing with them. In recent years, there is a rising interest in Islamic manuscripts of Mindanao and Sulu, and several researchers belonging to a younger generation are now engaged in searching and surveying other collections of manuscripts in Mindanao and Sulu. The languages used in manuscripts in Mindanao and Sulu are Arabic, Malay, and vernacular languages such as Tausuk, Magindanao, Maranao, Yakan, and Sama, which are written in the modified Arabic script. The use of two or more languages in a single manuscript is the rule rather than the exception. For example, some manuscripts Manuscripts contain several texts written in different languages. Arabic texts with interlinear Malay translation are not uncommon. There are also works in which an Arabic passage is followed by its Malay translation. There are also Arabic works with Maranao interlinear translation. 
it is not rare to find notes written in a language different from that of the main text. This is the statistics of the language or the combination of the languages used in the 37 manuscripts in the Sheikh Mohammed Said collection. These manuscripts were written during the period from the mid 18th to the mid 20th century. 20 volumes were slightly over half of the manuscripts are written entirely or mainly in Malay. Manuscripts which are written entirely or mainly in Arabic amount to 11 volumes comprising about 30%. There are two volumes in which Arabic and Malay are used in almost equal amounts comprising 5%. Four manuscripts are written entirely or mainly in Maranao, composing about 10%. Therefore, we can say that Malay is predominant, followed by Arabic, and then by Maranao. There are a couple of other smaller collections we have surveyed. Although detailed statistics are yet to be taken, the proportion of the use of Arabic seems to be higher in one of the collections because fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence works predominate in this collection. As each collection has its own characteristics, we should not generalize from the case of the Sheikh Muhammad Said collection. Nevertheless, we may reasonably say that Malay is substantially used in the manuscripts in the Lanao area in Mindanao. The Malay works found in manuscripts in the Sheikh Muhammad Said collection cover a wide range of subjects of Islamic scholarship, such as tafsir or Quranic exegesis, tajweed or the art of recitation of the Quran, hadith, fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence, theology, Sufism, astronomy, prayers, and others. Azimat or talismanic formula are also found. Let me show you some examples. This is one of the unique manuscripts in the collection. This manuscript is probably 200 years old or possibly more. This image shows the first page of the Sirusila Jalan Shatari or the spiritual genealogy of the Shatariya Sufi order. Dr. Fat Rahman discusses this manuscript in his article. These are mystical schematic drawings and accompanying Malay texts found in two manuscripts in the same collection. The image on the left hand side is from the manuscript we have just seen, while the one on the right hand side is from another manuscript. These two sets of drawings and texts are practically identical. We know from other sources that the manuscript on the left hand side is older than the one on the right hand side. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that the drawings and the texts in the manuscript on the right hand side was copied from the one on the left hand side. This shows that mystical drawings and texts circulated by copying, although it was within the same family collection in this case. There are other cases in which identical texts or drawings are found in manuscripts in the collections of different Islamic scholars in this area. This also indicates that Malay works circulated among Islamic scholars in this area by copying. Even a brief note of just a few lines may prove a rich mine of information. This is an ownership note in Malay found in another manuscript. It says, this book is Bidayat al Mubtadi, owned by Inchit Abdul Wahab, who is Puranakan Magindanao, which means a person of mixed Magindanao parentage and lives in the country of Sulu under the reign of Sultan Muhammad Muizuddin ibn Sultan Muhammad Badaruddin. It shows that a person of mixed Magindanao parentage lived in Sulu, that 
ビダヤット・エルム・ブタディ、a popular Malay work on Islam for the beginners,、uh, was、uh, found its way to a library of an Islamic scholar in Lano del Sur. Therefore, this note eloquently speaks of the movement of people as well as circulation of Malay manuscripts in the Mindanao and Sulu region. The Sultan of Sulu mentioned in the note ranged from 1748 to 64. Therefore, if this note is reliable, this manuscript originated during this period, and it is one of the oldest manuscripts in this collection. This is the Malay Maranao vocabulary found in another manuscript. The word at the right end of the first line is Mugeruti, a Malay word which means to understand. The word written underneath diagonally reads Katawan, a Maranao word which means to understand. The next word on the first line is Dari, a Malay word which means to run. The Maranao word with the same meaning, Kapalagoi, is written beneath it. The last word on the first line is Sungai, a Malay word for river, accompanied by the Maranao word for river, that is Lawasaik. Therefore, these notes served the purpose of a dictionary. It shows how the owner of the manuscript taught himself the meaning of these Malay words. This is a travel account of Tuan Muhammad Said, who went on Hajj journey to Mecca in the early 19th century as one of the earliest Hajjits from this region. He is the same scholar I mentioned earlier who copied the illuminated Quran manuscript Maradika during his Hajj journey. This travel account is written in Malay. And gives an account of his voyage from Hudaida to Jitta, a shipwreck he suffered on the way, and his arrival at Jitta, and finally Mecca in 1804. The text of this travel account is presented with a translation in the annotated catalog of, this, of the collection. This is a Malay tafsir or Quranic exegesis, which covers the first four chapters of the Quran. The Quranic verses are written in red, followed by explanations in Malay in black ink. This tafsir is discussed by Dr. Nur Tawab in a chapter of the catalog of the collection. This is a compilation of hadith in Arabic with interlinear Malay translation. Under the Arabic text is added Malay translation. On the right hand page, the Malay translation is further accompanied by Maranao translation in different handwriting and ink. This shows that the contents of the Arabic work was understood through the intermediary of Malay translation. Which was further translated into Maranao for those who do not understand Malay. This image shows Azimat or a talismanic formula and medicinal verses and drawings found in another manuscript. Some of the texts are in Malay, while some others are in Arabic. In the 19th century, Printed books in Malay and Arabic, which are called Kitab Jawi or Kitab Kuni, circulated among Muslims in Southeast Asia. 27 volumes of such printed kitabs are held in the Sheikh Muhammad Said collection. This image shows that two different volumes of such printed books are bound into a new volume. On the right hand side is the last page of an Arabic book. Tanbif al Gafirin, and on the left hand side is a popular Malay book on medicine and other knowledge entitled Mujarabat. As we have seen, Malay works found in the collection cover a wide range of subjects of Islamic scholarship, as well as 
more popular religious knowledge such as azimat and also a travel account and notes and other matters. These writings inform us of their intellectual activities and also afford us glimpses into their lives. Let us consider the relationship between Malay works and vernacular works, especially Marana works. Some of the Malay works in the collections were further copied, either fully or partially, and circulated among Islamic intellectuals in Mindanao. Some Malay works were also translated into or adapted to Maranao. There are also Maranao adaptations from Malay works. For example, there is a Maranao version of Sifat Duapuru or 20 Attributes of Allah, a Malay work popular among the Muslims in Southeast Asia. Thus, Malay manuscripts stimulated Maranao's interest in religious knowledge and inspired them to translate them into their own language and to create a new manuscript. Now, I will focus on popular Islamic literature and discuss the transmission of Malay works and their influences on the worldview of Maranaos. Until the mid 20th century, there were only a few means of available for people to obtain Islamic knowledge because of a general lack of Islamic educational institutions. Therefore, Islamic stories narrated by religious leaders or elders played an important role in transmitting Islamic knowledge to the ordinary Muslims. This is the entrance of the Padang Karubara historical park in the municipality of Bayang in Lanao del Sur. Padang is a Malay word which means a plain or a field. Karubara is a name of a city on the west bank of the Euphrates River in the present Iraq. Karbala in Iraq is a famous place sacred to the Muslims because it is where Hussain, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, fought a fierce battle against the army of Yazid, the, success, the successor of Muawiyah, and was murdered in the year 680. You might wonder why there is a park named Padang Karbala in Mindanao. It is because the, this is where local Maranao people hold up in a fortified structure called Kota and fought against the American expeditionary forces commanded by Colonel Frank Baldwin in 1902. They were, however, subdued by the attack of the American troops, and as many as 300 to 400 Mano people were killed in this battle. This battle is known as the Battle of Baya. After the battle, the Mano people began to call the site of the battle Padang Karbala, comparing it with the site of Saint's martyrdom in Karbala in Iraq. This is a stone marker erected at the foot of the site of the Battle of Bayan in 2002 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Bayan. The inscription says, on this sacred ground in Padang Karbala lie the remains of hundreds of martyred noblemen from the Sultanate whose heroic defense against the American expeditionary forces from May 2 to 3, 1902 signal the beginning of the Moro American War from 1902 to 1915. The Battle of Bayan has a symbolic meaning to the Maranaos in particular, as well as the Muslims in the Philippines in general. It represents their valor and indomitable spirit to fight against foreign aggressors and the injustices brought about by colonizers. But how did the Mano people in the early 20th century learn about the Battle of Karbala and the martyrdom of Hussein, an incident which took place thousands of miles away and more than 12 centuries earlier? And why did they use the Malay word Pada to refer to the field instead of a Marano word with the same meaning? A medium through which the Maranaos learned about the martyrdom of Hussein 
was the Maranao story called Balaprangan. It is a Maranao version of a Malay literary work entitled Hikayat Muhammad Hanafiya. The first part of the story recounts the martyrdom of Hussein and his followers in Karbala. The latter part deals with Muhammad Hanafiya, a half brother of Hussein, who fought against Yazid. Hikayat Muhammad Hanafiya is mentioned in Sujara Mulayu or Malay Annals. It says that the Malay warriors in the Malacca court read this story during the siege of Malacca by the Portuguese in 1511 so that the story might inspire them with courage. The word Barapragan probably originated from the Malay word Burpuran, which means to fight. Barapuragan was narrated in a very emotional way and touched the heartstrings of the Maranao people. There is also a brief Malay text in a manuscript in the Sheikh Muhammad Said collection, which mentions the martyrdom of Hussein. The term Padang Karbala is also used in this text. The text gives an explanation of Ashura and says as follows. Oh, all Muslims and believers do not forget those who died as martyrs in the way of God at Padang Karbala, or the field of Karbala. I have enclosed the words Padang Karbala in brackets in yellow in this image. The author of the note appears not to forget this tragedy. This manuscript originates during the period from the mid 18th to the late 19th century. Therefore, it is clear that the martyrdom of Hussein and the term Padang Karbara had been known to the Maranaos by the time the Battle of Bayan took place in their own land in 1902. This is a note written in Maranao by Sheikh Muhammad Said bin Imam Sabayan, the former owner of the collection, on the blank sheet of paper attached to a Malay printed book and bound into a volume. It mentions the Battle of Bayan. Year 1322, which should actually read 1320. This is when the killings at Padang Karbala in Bayan took place, 1902, Hijra, 1322, May 2. I have underlined the words Padang Karbala in the image. This note is dated 1963. It said that Sheikh Muhammad Said bin Imam Sabayan was 61 years old at the time. It means that he was born in 1902, the very year the Battle of Bayan took place, or possibly the year before. This brief note shows that the killings in the Battle of Bayan were deeply engraved in the collective me me memory of Maranaos, including this Islamic scholar. It is certain that he left a record of this tragic incident so that the coming generations of Maranaos would not forget it. Therefore, this note is intended to his descendants who would inherit the book. The Malay book to which this note was attached physically served as the medium of this message. The Sheikh Muhammad Said collection also has a copy of a Malay lithographed book of Hikayat Hanafiya published in Bombay. Although the book is undated, it was probably published during the period from the late 19th to the early 20th century. It shows thus that this Mali story was also circulated in Lanao del Sur through a printed copy. The term Padang Karbala is also used in this Mali story to refer to the place of the battle and the martyrdom of Hussein. Let's look at the relationship between Malay works on Islamic eschatology and the Marana work with similar contents. The three Malay works, namely a Malay version of Dakai Kar Akbar fi Dikrar Janna, translated by, by Linga, Akbar Akira by Nuruddin Raniri, 
and Kashful Gaibia by Zainul Abidin bin Al Fatani. These three works have similar contents. There is a Marano story called Kabarol Akirat, which deals with similar topics. This diagram compares the structures of the three Malay works and the Marana work Kabarol Akirat. The three Malay works have similar structures. On the other hand, the structure of Kabarol Akirat is different from those of the Malay works although it contains some accounts similar to those in the Malay works. These are accounts of hell on the judgment day, the creation of the universe from light of Muhammad, and the description of paradise. However, Kabarol Akirat has several sections or accounts which are not found in the three Malay works. This indicates that the Maranao story, Kabarol Akirat, is not a mere translation of these Malay eschatological works. Instead, it consists of various accounts taken from several different sources, which are compiled into a single work. This is a schematic diagram representing the relationship between three Malay works and Maranao works on similar topics. Based on the comparative analysis of their contents, I argue that the three Malay works on eschatology provided sources for Marana works. However, the author of Kabarol Akirat adapted various pieces of accounts or episodes from other sources and adapted them to the needs and tastes of the Marana people. By doing so, they were able to bring the teaching of Islam closer to the ordinary people who are not specialists in Islamic studies and who do not understand Malay. Thus, Malay manuscripts and books played an important role in transmitting Islamic knowledge to the Muslims in Mindanao, even though the use of Malay was limited to a small circle of Islamic scholars and merchants in this part of Mindanao. Around the mid-20th century, however, a shadow began to fall over the predominance of Malay as the language of Islamic learning in Mindanao. In the 1950s, a group of Muslim scholars from Mindanao who had graduated from Islamic educational institutions in the Middle East began to come home. They launched a movement to reform Islamic education and the prevailing religious practices at home. They promoted the use of Arabic as the language of Islamic learning in place of Malay. They also criticized Malay religious manuscripts and books, saying that they contained errors and deviations. As a result, Malay manuscripts and printed books were gradually abandoned, some were even destroyed, and gradually replaced by Arabic books on Islam published in the Middle Eastern countries, and also by their Maranao translations. So today, we hardly see any Malay books on Islam in bookshops and stalls in Mindanao or Metro Manila. Instead, Islamic books in Arabic, the Maranao, Tagalog, and English are sold in these shops. Malay Islamic manuscripts and books seems to be forgotten. Does this mean that Malay manuscripts and books are no longer important? Have they left any legacies? And if so, what are they? To conclude, I will point out the following two points as the legacy of man manuscripts, Monday manuscripts and books which circulated in Mindanao. First, Malay manuscripts and books provided knowledge in many fields of Islamic scholarship, as well as more popular religious knowledge. They inspired the Muslims in Mindanao to develop a worldview based on Islam. Even though Malay literacy was limited to a small circle of people in central Mindanao, the contents of Malay works circulated much more broadly through translation and adaptation in vernacular languages. They were also orally transmitted in vernacular languages. As a result, 
the information and messages contained in Malay works reached the ordinary Muslim audience who did not understand Malay. Second, Malay manuscripts and books inspired the Muslims in Mindanao to translate, adapt, or arrange Malay works, to write their own works in their own languages, and to create their own manuscripts and books. Thus, manuscripts, Malay manuscripts and printed books contributed to the development of manuscript and book cultures of the Muslims in Mindanao. Therefore, Malay manuscripts and books paved the way for the development of religious literature and thoughts in Mindanao. Even though we hardly see Malay manuscripts or books in Mindanao today, they played an important role in informing a worldview of the Muslims in Mindanao and in integrating them into the wider intellectual network of Muslims in Southeast Asia and beyond. Thank you.